Hi, everybody. My name is Zach Hacken. I'm here with Kevin Bartlett. We're the co-founders of Cobia Holdings. And Kevin is a notable real estate agent in Southwest Florida, one of the top performing agents in Southwest Florida. We're talking about real estate here today, what's happening in the local market in Q3 2023. And uh, thank you for joining us, Kevin. Could you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Hi guys, Kevin Bartlett here with uh, Knowledge Base with Realty World and Astero. Just a uh, little bit about me. I was born and raised in Southwest Florida. I uh, jumped into real estate about eight years ago and, uh, you know, I've grown since then. Uh, looking forward to uh, an exciting show with Zach here. <laughs> Very cool. And yeah, I'm Zach Katkin. I've, I'm not a native, but uh, almost. I, I moved down about 30 years ago now. And I started a number of businesses, including an ad agency in, uh, in Estero while I was at FGCU. Sold that and basically have done real estate ever since in one way, shape, or form. Worked with a number of brokerages, uh, as well as teams and uh, Kevin himself. So, uh, Kevin, can you talk a little bit about your business specifically, what you do, what you provide, um, what kind of real estate you transactions you're involved in? Yeah. So, what we do is uh, I'm specifically uh, geared towards the Bonita Estero area, uh, you know, and then, you know, just overriding due to what people like and what they want. Uh, Naples and uh, Fort Myers area as well with Cape Coral uh, often too. But, you know, we specialize in selling our lifestyle down in Southwest Florida. And we specialize in marketing our properties in luxury communities to the fullest extent possible. We reach out to different, you know, states, different countries to bring our buyers, you know, to our listings and to make sure our sellers have great communication throughout the whole process and have a great experience. So they were, you know, send referrals from up north. Gotcha. Uh, what is there a price range that you typically deal in or, you know, number of um, bedrooms, that kind of thing? Like what, what size houses are we talking about generally? Well, you know, that's a loaded question. People always like to ask that, right? They think uh, you have to sell a million dollar house to sell another million dollar house, which, you know, really isn't the case down here. You know, we have such a broad aspect of life and uh, different, you know, types of people. A lot of people, you know, they start with a condo, they move to a villa, they move to a single family house, and then they move to an estate home or a golf community. So we specialize in selling our lifestyle and golf communities around our Southwest Florida region. Gotcha. And how many, you said you've been in the business for eight years. How, how many transactions have you done? How many, uh, what's the volume you've done overall? Uh, sales volume I've done around uh, probably, you know, nearing $400 million in uh, sales volume, which translates to about 1,100 deals. And awesome. transactions in the business, you know, so it, as we're coming into a bad market um, and n stuff's not selling like it did when the COVID craze happened, you got to have a very knowledgeable agent to navigate through the process and, you know, no, one that knows how to be creative and problem solve, basically. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, and one thing I did want to, you know, take a moment to to explain as well is that so... At the beginning of this year, just, just after um, Hurricane Ian, we decided to found Cobia Holdings. And so what, what Cobia Holdings is, ultimately, I, I'd like to think of us as a solutions company um, where maybe an individual doesn't know what to do with their real estate. In the case of what happened with Ian, homes were damaged. How do I, you know, do I repair it? Do I try to sell it, et cetera, et cetera. So Cobia, what we concentrate on is... Um, so wholesale real estate, so buying properties and then fixing and flipping them or fixing them and renting them out for cash flow purposes. Um, and I think that's relevant. We're kind of coming at this from two different angles, you from the real estate sales side. Um, and then together, I'd say probably us both as far as the wholesale side for the rest of this discussion as we talk about, you know, what's going on in the real estate market overall. Um, so can you speak to, <clears throat> I think the big thing that I've certainly noticed, I mean, this, um, I think this was real, um, evident to anybody that was paying attention. Um, like what, what happened with the pandemic and, and Florida real estate? Can you, can you go into some detail about that? Well, uh, 
besides everyone going crazy because they had to go ahead and get down to Southwest Florida or any part of uh, the country that still was open during lockdown. You know, I remember walking into my ex-girlfriend's house during, you know, the, the first shutdown. And I was wearing a really nice, you know, suit, dressed up, about to hit my last appointment of the day. And uh, I had to stop by her house and grab something uh, that I forgot. And uh, I remember getting one call, two calls, five calls, <laughs> ten calls of people canceling their contracts. And it was right around the end of May, right after my birthday. You know, my birthday is March 21st. And people were just saying, we want to cancel our contracts. We don't want to buy. We're done. COVID, you know, we don't know what this is going to do. We think we're going to go into a third world war. And we just we're too concerned that, you know, we're going to lose all our money or we're going to lose our jobs. Mm-hmm. And I lost about 18 contracts that day. Oh, wow. And knowing how hard it took me to finally, that was my time where I'd really been doing this for about five years at that point. I felt like an agent. I felt like I was, you know, doing something every single day. Um, You know, not just calling people randomly and uh, trying to get their business and earn their business. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that day really taught me, uh, you know, the swings and uh, what could happen. But, you know, there were two people that stayed in contract and uh you know they ended up making a ton of money because they kept their contracts and they bought at the bottom they you know a week later stuff was starting to move two weeks later there were free feeding frenzies of everything three weeks later you know the market was just out of control at that point and for Wait. two and a half solid years the market just continued to go to roaring. Gotcha. So, so it took about three weeks or a month between it totally bottoming out, people being deathly afraid to all of a sudden the mass migration that happened, you know, exploded the, the amount of deals that were taking place and the amount of homes that were being sold. Yeah, correct. And, you know, the big thing for a lot of this was we had a lot of people come into town and not realize what was going on. And, you know, but all they cared about, we want to get out of where we're at right now. We're tired of being locked down. Mm -hmm. We don't like our governor. We don't like our political state. We, you know, every, we can't enjoy our life. We see Florida, people are still boating. People are still going to pick up, you know, to go margaritas, to go food. And you still could do some stuff, but it wasn't like you could do everything and live a normal life still. But we had some, a lot more freedom compared to other people. Right, exactly. Yeah, and I I think, you know, it's something that we're blessed in Southwest Florida. Obviously, I was here for that as well. We were one of the least locked down areas in the whole country. Um, And I, I thought that was amazing. Where, where where do you think people were, or where have you seen people were coming from? Uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, New York, New Jersey. New York and New Jersey re- got re- hit really hard. A lot of people just, they didn't want to be in the city anymore. I mean, Miami exploded. It became the new uh, Wall Street. You know, v- VC funds charged down here. Um, everyone, you know, every state came, but a lot of them were just, you know, random states even. But big ones would be California, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Gotcha. Um, and I did, uh, I found a little graph. I'm going to probably pull some stuff up later on. Uh, but th- these were the uh, kind of a, a cumulative index of what happened. And you can see how much we exploded. What I found interesting is, and in all the numbers I've looked at, is that from what I can tell, um, that we grew both nationwide as well as specifically, obviously Florida and some other areas like Texas, but, but Florida really more than anybody else faster than we did <clears throat> during the great, you know, housing boom and bust of, you know, 2006, seven, eight. I, I just, I find that incredible. And you can see we outpaced as quickly as people moved 
and inventory changed hands in the U.S., Florida outpaced that with this um, light green line that, that you have here on the screen. <clears throat> gotcha. So let me do back here. So, well, then, like, now, obviously, the pandemic essentially came to a close, weirdly enough, around, you know, a year and a half ago, sort of, uh, or it started to. Um, what have you seen since since the pandemic? Really, I'd say the last two years, like, what was 2022 like? What has 2023 been like? And, and uh, maybe we'll talk about what, uh, where you see things heading. I know that's a huge question. Well, you know, that's a good question. And uh, if I have my crystal ball i probably would win the ball tonight and you would never ever hear from me ever again (laughs) you know the the things i can comment on you know the past two years 2022 prices hit you know the top the ceiling and now they're falling down because we have these interest rate hikes that won't stop we have a government that you know is trying to curb inflation right now and what does that do to all, you know, basically the three hundred and four hundred thousand dollar homes are crushed right now because those are the people that, you know, paying 8% really hurts. Mm-hmm. Um, luckily, in a market like we're in, you mostly deal with second homes, cash, uh, financing that contingent on closing the property. It's just, you know, kind of secondary money. But right now, what saved us last year was Hurricane Ian. Hurricane Ian recharged the whole marketplace and it really disrupted what they were trying to do locally, in my opinion, because you brought in a lot of investors, you brought a lot of company, a big, big companies that came in and started to buy rehab properties. They came in and they're dropping $50 million on just land. And, you know, a lot of new construction is going to be built during this uh, time. So we won't see the real factors come in until five to seven years down the road. But 2022, if we didn't have Hurricane Ian, definitely would have, we would be in a worse state right now. Gotcha. You know, yeah. So we're seeing prices. I just sold a house that I had under contract ex- exactly one year ago. And the house was under contract for 615 last year. This were we're under contract for five thirty seven. Gotcha. Right after they remodeled because it did flood, but you know it just it goes to show you we're twelve percent down. You know the the market's not bearing what it, it has in the past two years. So you do know, you, do you see that that number twelve percent or fifteen? What is is there a number that generally you've seen? You know, year over year, here's where we're at. We're about. I would say 11% down overall. Some communities are down a lot more. Others are, others are, you know, staying the same. It just depends on what kind of local uh, marketplace you have for each community. Yeah. Um, and that's the big thing. Do you find that, cause I was talking to a buddy of mine um, and he was curious if, you know, the, the larger homes, let's say a million dollars and up, are those generally more insulated from this, you know, price dipping or is it basically all over the place literally it's a a case-by-case basis where this particular community could be next to another one but because of certain amenities it's just not changing or is even going up do you see any patterns basically no it's you know lock stock and barrel it's all luck um certain communities that are newer of course that don't need updating you know uh those are the ones that you see going doing well still Mm -hmm. a big issue is if you have an updated house and say a farm community that i i really like to do business in like bonita bay or pelican landing those communities have always been older you're selling multi-different products over there and they're up still but if the house isn't updated or if people deem that they feel like eh, you know we could go buy new over this and spend a million dollars more uh, for single family. Of course, they're going to do that because they, w- they don't want to deal with it. Gotcha. Okay. 
Um, we talked a little bit about Hurricane Ian. Can you go into more detail on that? And Idalia, if that affected anybody in the area as well. Like what, what changes do you see coming? Uh, well, what changes did it lead to, obviously, right away? And then, and I, you know, I think there's some, some things we could speak to as far as the, the kind of the wholesale side of things. But, uh, and what do you see longer term with that? Well, I think a lot of people that bought hurricane damage properties and didn't sell it right now, they're in a world of hurt because they're going to try and get these astronomical amounts of money and it's not going to happen. Gotcha. That's the issue. And, you know, people have to be realistic of what's going on. We're not in a, a hyperinflated market with buyers. You know, that I think that changes around here in the next five, six months when we get back into season. But, uh, you know, I bought three hurricane flooded houses that we made. We turned into Airbnbs with a couple partners. And, uh, you know, I always told my buyers, man, it's a hundred year storm. I've lived here my whole life. What could possibly happen? Well, you know, we got a little bit of water in one of the Airbnbs that we had, and we had a big scare. So what do you think that, you know, that's going to do to the market? If you rebuilt the house and it flooded, you, you know, you claim your insurance again and you probably move far far away <laughs> right right but uh you know it depends on you know where you're at how high of an elevation you had and what type of uh, price point you were at but i think a lot of people are going to stay away from the coast unless they rebuild to you know proper standards because it's just a hassle to move all your stuff out to deal with you know being flooded and i think ultimately no one wants to deal with that and especially someone that lives on the water and it's a second home they want to come down and they want to enjoy. So they would rather tear down and build new or gotcha. relocate. Right. Gotcha. Where, where do you see people relocating to, you know, east of 75, east of 41, new construction, you stuff away from the water, not in a flood zone. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, can you, can you speak to that? Actually, any of the, um, I know DeSantis came under fire with some of his supposed reforms, like, and we've gone, we've worked on a couple of projects where it was difficult for people to get flood insurance. What's going on in that market? You can get flood insurance. The government backs it, you know. Have they prices wanted, gone up? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> right. And yeah. They've got to make their money back. It's a business. Right. But, you know, you have citizens, which I'm insured through, right? And citizens will insure me for a reasonable amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. But if there's a hurricane, even if I'm not damaged, I still have to pay a deductible of seventeen five. Oh wow, really? I didn't I didn't know. Even if you're not damaged. That's right. Everyone that takes citizens insurance will be it's like seventeen fifty it's not seventeen thousand five hundred, it's seventeen fifty. Wow. Per person, you know, but it's you know, they're insuring and they're reinsuring because that you know you lose money down in this state that's why no one wants to insure it right right gotcha um uh going back to something you said a minute ago so basically is this the trend that you've seen uh, weirdly enough when covid first hit all transactions stopped but then obviously as we we saw with the graph prices and transactions just skyrocketed then it slowed down that slowing down was what right around when um hurricane ian happened correct and so basically people there's some people that either just bought in 2022 and then the uh, ian hits floods their home and now they're thinking about okay again with a dahlia hitting and having some flooding maybe this isn't the right home for me if i'm too close to the coast let me move inland but they're finding that prices are about 11 percent down is that yeah, roughly, a good summary yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. gotcha. Because that's, I mean, that's one thing that you and I have talked about that we've seen a lot where people are interested in selling their homes for one reason or other, but there's just no, um, you know, and you have, I think, ingrained interests locally, organizations, groups, that all they want to do is tout the positives of the real estate market. But, the you know, at the end of the day, we live in reality. People have to buy and sell homes at a particular price. There's a market for this. And what we're seeing is that people are reluctant to sell homes they just bought a year ago if they're going to have to take 11% haircut. Uh, well, of course. Would you want to do that? Right. No, absolutely not. And but I think a lot of this has to do with, you know, touching briefly on this point, 
we had a fuel of the stock market, the crypto market, anything that you put your money into, it, it went up. And you got a lot of people that came out with a ton more money than what they should have. And COVID fueled something because it pushed everyone down here. Yeah. Now everything's back open up north. Stocks went down. Cryptos went down. Interest rates went up. And, you know, going into interest rates and what where do I think prices will be in the next 6 to 18 months? I think prices are going to be at the same or higher in the next 6 to 18 months just because the Fed is going to drop interest rates after one more hike. And we've already reached a near 8% rate. So if we go up to 8.5, you know, nothing changes. You're still paying a lot of money. You really think that though, that a, I mean, I think the, the, the fact that obviously so much in real estate follows interest rates, but that interest rates are going to be dropping. Yeah, I I do. Gotcha. I I think next year someone is going to try to use it as a political influence. Yeah. It's just, it, it is what it is. But my thing is, prices probably are going to do 3 to 5% yearly increases like what's normal in Florida. And, uh, you know, you're not going to make 20% per year anymore. That, that's going to be the big thing. Um, my thing about, you know, I just bought a new house, right? And I have a 6.5% interest rate. My first house I bought three years ago to move into my interest rate was 2.75%. My total payment was $1,300. Hmm. My total payment is $4,500 now yeah. for $100,000 more. If I still had my first house, do you think I would have moved? Right. And I think, you know, that's where interest rates and pricing is going to get really tricky because if interest rates go back down to 5.5%, it's going to start a feeding frenzy of buyers again because they're going to want to get in before they hike rates up again, mentally. Because rent's not really dropping around here. It's just kind of staying the same. With that, people just can't comprehend selling their house with a 3% rate, even though they have a ton of equity in it and go into a new house to pay more per month. Gotcha. Right. <clears throat> and that, yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Even if they're able to pull out that equity, you know, it's basically from their perspective, getting drained much more quickly and they're paying way higher for the, you know, something similar or, you know, around the same price range. So. That's right. It does what, make what a lot of you? sense. What do you what? think? <laughs> right. I think I think rates are going to continue to go up. Uh, I think they they for multiple reasons. Um, in fact, I can share my screen again. Let's, let's provide a counter argument. <clears throat> I think this this graph is fascinating. Uh, I found this on the census. So, Just, uh, in not to interrupt you in 2024 october 1st if rates are down what are we going to put a wager on this for do 100 bucks all right 100 bucks okay all we'll right go. yeah a year, a year from now that sounds good <clears throat> um but i found this this graph fascinating it's not exactly what it was what we were talking about previously but it just you can see where people migrated to um, mm-hmm. and you can see even in New York, New Jersey, uh, people even moved to more rural areas of New York, New Jersey in the Northeast. Um, this kind of speaks to something we were saying, but we, maybe we can get back to that and talk about rent specifically, but, um, Jamie Dimon. So this was a couple days ago. Yeah. Two days ago. Um, world may not be prepared for fed at 7%, right? So he's Jamie's calling for, for 7%. Now, obviously, he lies all the time, and they do like you know head fakes to get the market to do one thing, and then they move in a different direction. So that's something to consider. But also, Powell said 
something similar. <clears throat> and, you know, a strong uh, or a high, high rate means a strong dollar, uh, you know, puts pressure on the world. There's a lot of geopolitical stuff happening, and unfortunately affects everybody. But um, so, so, yeah, I think, I mean, the economy still clearly we're in a recession. I don't think anybody would actually deny that at this point. Um, you know, you look at inflation, you look at the cost of goods, you look at, you go to any fast food place, restaurant, the grocery store, everything is super expensive. But uh, I think there's more pain to be wrung out of the average person, unfortunately, and that's what they're going to be doing. So I think the rates are going to going to creep up and things are going to continue to slow down. Um, you know, with with there's kind of a larger thesis or plan there, but that's that's my prediction. All right. Well, I'm going to take a hundred bucks next year. <laughs> right. So do you think, I'm curious, do you think, um, yeah, that's good. I mean, the, the, I, the one thing I haven't really factored into this is it being an election year and how right before, you know, the six months, three months before, you know, rates drop, gas prices drop, et cetera, to, to help, you know, sway public opinion in, in different directions. Is that basically the crux of your argument? Correct. Yep. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, that, that does make sense. But um, but I still think I, I think there's more pain to be had. I mean, I don't I I I see a continued slowing of the market personally. No pain, no gain. Right. 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 Exactly. So and a, a interesting thing that you noted that I did do some research on kind of a separate topic, but um, the big basically rents becoming a gigantic business and. Uh, a lot of the major investors for conventional commercial real estate and um, you know office supply is going into just regular residential rentals, uh, which I find fascinating. So, <clears throat> um, and they're investing all over the country. Prices. So, one thing that we've talked about a bit is how weird this market is right now. There's very low inventory. People do want to sell, but they're confused about you know the price drop that's happened. So we've we've come to the conclusion that this is one of the rarest market opportunities where it's both a good time to buy and sell. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit? With it being the, a good time to sell? Well, both buy and sell. So if you were a buyer, why is it a good time to buy in Southwest Florida? If you're a seller, why is it a good time to sell? Well, well here's, uh, you know... The one and only selling right now, you're going to pull all the opportunity costs out. You might sell for a little bit less than what you could have a year ago, but you can never time the market. So you're still getting out ahead. Um, and you can also probably wait. If you sell right now, you can wait out the market and create a, you know, either go back at, you know, to your, your, your primary home, you can move locally in Southwest Florida upsize or downsize, but you know, most people are going to take chips off their table and uh, you know, most likely downsize if they stay, but you know, people are still selling houses. They're still, still selling them for a hundred times more than what they were uh, before COVID. And, you know, you never know where the market's going to go. So I mean, that that's all the consideration itself. If you're buying down here, you're going to pay out absurd amounts of rent. You're never going to be able to, you know, come back and, you know, you can always refinance. So if you like the house and you're going to stay there a long time, you know, I don't really see the big point of overpaying because everything in real estate always goes up in value over time. So as long as you, you have a good agent and you're smart, you know, that's really what you need to do more than anything is just have an agent that really cares and wants to work with you for your whole entire purchasing career, in my opinion, because they won't sell you something that they don't feel, you don't have faith in. Gotcha. Okay. How, how much, uh, if you had to estimate between pre COVID and then at the absolute boom of Q4 2022, what do you think the average home price was up to? like percent wise you know like it grew from 200 to 300 so it increased 50 percent oh, it, it probably it's 400 uh, 400 plus thousand that's why our conforming loan limit went up nearly a hundred thousand dollars 
you know, just to stay, you know, be able to make sure people could still buy in Collier County specifically. Mm -hmm. But I bet you're into the fours. It it had to double. Gotcha. So the the price increase was uh, around 100% from, you know. 130%, I would bet. Gotcha. Okay. One quick graph I found that I thought you might find interesting is this one here. Um, I couldn't believe, and it it basically tells the tale that we've, we've talked to many homeowners over the last couple of months that are in this exact scenario, especially if they're in a condo. Mm -hmm. Um, And this was for, um, for Lee and Collier County. Actually, I think this was specific to Lee County. And the, the, obviously this is an average, but if you look at, especially this, this green or teal graph, we had a huge spike towards the end of 2022. And now we're in August of, of this year the latest data that they had, you know, it's down 58% there, you know, the sale price. And that's, you know, over the last 12 months. Now this is an average. So maybe people in a particular community that were affected by a hurricane or something liquidated. And so that, that skews the numbers to some extent, but I, I just think that's, that's, uh, I don't know, astronomical. <clears throat> Agree. I mean, you know, I specialize in Bonita Estero, right? Mm-hmm. And the communities I like are Wild Blue, Esplanade Lake Club, Miramar Lakes, Pelican Landing, and Bonita Bay. Shadowwood, sometimes depending on the client, but you know, it's crazy. So many people go to Pelican Landing, to Bonita Bay, to Wild Blue, to Esplanade Lake Club, and to Miramar Lakes to shop around to see which community fits their lifestyle the best. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ultimately those values you're, you're showing me a house in wild blue. I could kick myself for, I should have bought four from Lennar when they dropped the prices from 700,000 to 550 for Somerville twos on the big lake, because those houses are now selling for $1.2 million. The big boys in uh, Wild Blue, they were selling for seven hundred. Now they're selling for one point seven. Mm-hmm. In Esplanade Lake Club, they were selling, you know, eight fifty. Now those are two million dollars. Miramar Lakes, it was a million six. Now it's you know three point two. Everything there, you know, Bonita Bay included. Everything just doubled without uh, an inkling, and you know, people just. It, you know, they saw their home values go up and they were out. <laughs> they gotcha. thought we were hitting the top and that was it. Yeah. Uh, um, I wonder if, you know, can you detail like, like Bonita Bay? What, what, uh, what do you see in Bonita Bay? What do you like about Bonita Bay? What, what's, what are transactions doing in there right now? They're doing pretty well, but they're stacking up on inventory again. I just sold a, a high rise in there for two point two. We got a fantastic deal; it was worth two point six. Mm-hmm. But the guy needed to sell because he bought new construction in there. Um, but ultimately, I mean, stuff's closing within ninety seven percent of list price in there if you're priced right. I love Bonita Bay because it has the marina access directly inside. You can join golf. You know, you can join the beach club and then has the beach shuttle as well. Uh, Pelican Landing, I like because the golf course, uh, you know, the colony connects to it if you want a little newer and more modern. But without a doubt, the ferry that you get with Pelican Landing specifically is the best. Mm -hmm. You can't beat that. Wild Blue and Esplanade Lake Club, they're resort style boating communities. And uh, and that's Miramar Lakes as well. But, you know, Miramar Lakes takes the cake because, you know, the sandy beaches and the huge sprawling uh, amenity center. But they all three shared the common thing. Boating, tiki bars, and lifestyle. The three Mm -hmm. things people want when they come into it. When you when you say boating, especially I was, you know, I kind of knew this with Miramar Lakes, but I didn't understand this with Wild Blue. Um, what do you mean by boating or boating lifestyle within those communities? Well, I mean, it's like a wannabe lake to, you know, in New Hampshire or, you know, a lake in Alabama or Georgia. You know, we just have alligators. So, <laughs> you know, that that's the one thing that people have to get used to. But you're able to put in a little boat up to 28 foot, ride around, 
um, and enjoy the Florida lifestyle and boat up to your clubs and, you know, get off and have dinner, drinks, and then go back to your house. Oh, that's great. I didn't, I really did. I had no idea that wild blue had that, that you could boat inside the community in the, in the lakes in the community. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So wild blue, right. You have, um, houses from 500,000 to $6 million now because mm-hmm. it's, you know, stock built on the Island in there, WCI, uh, and stock built on the bigger lake on the wild blue side, Lenar built on Vista blue. And then Pulte built on the, the other bigger, smaller lake. They all have jet skis on Pulte's lake, and then they built off water as well. Gotcha. You know, Esplanade Lake Club is Pulte Villa is 124 of them, and uh, you know Taylor Morrison project, and there were about 30 homes by Seagate Construction, super high end, very beautiful. Those are all sold out, of course, because those are the first things to go. And then Miramar Lakes, you know, they have one little section left, which is going to be high rises, and then uh, the San Marino new town homes that are coming up. But that's pretty much it. Gotcha. Very cool. All right. Well, I think that about wraps it, everything up. Unless there's anything else that you wanted to to talk about or communicate. No, I mean, all you know, if people are interested in learning more about me, uh, they can visit my website at knowledgebasefl.com. And uh, learn a little bit about myself. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kevin. It was great talking to you. And uh, we'll see who owes who $100 a year from now. Sounds good. All right. Take care, man. Have a nice day. You too. Bye.